the book club for kids. It's the book club for kids. It's the book club for kids podcast. Hi, I'm Kitty Feldy. This week, it's everybody in the pool. Our book is called Swim Team, a story about learning to swim and the historic discrimination that put most pools off limits to people of color. Writer Johnny Christmas says it was inspired by real life events. When I was a child, about five years old, I fell into a swimming pool and I almost drowned. He isn't the only one not completely at home in the water. I can kind of swim, but not really. I usually need a pool noodle. That's one of our readers from the Girlfriends Book Club Baltimore. We have a swimming guru in the house and she has some advice. Remember, everyone learns step by step, learning a little more each time. It's a process. That's our aquatic expert. Olympic medal winner Natalie Hines is our celebrity reader. And this is the Book Club for Kids, the show where kids talk about books. We'll tell you how you can be on the show a little later on, but first, let's meet our readers. Hello, my name is Imani. I'm in third grade. I go to St. Joseph's Fullerton, and it's in Baltimore. Hi, my name is Lauren, and I'm in sixth grade, and I go to Garrison Forest School in Owings Mills. Hello, my name is Samara. I'm in the sixth grade, and I go to Baltimore Montessori Public Charter School. So what is that book about? The book is about a girl named Bree who really wants to learn how to swim, and she tries really hard, and she met a couple of friends along the way, and in, in the end, she was able to be a really good swimmer. Bree is a problem, though, because she may be on the swim team, but she, she can't swim. How, um, how does she learn how to actually be able to swim? There was this lady named Miss Edda. She taught Bree how to swim. At first she was kind of scared. Miss Edda taught her how to swim and soon enough she wasn't like afraid and she started going back to the swim team. Uh, tell us about Miss Edda. Miss Edda really likes doing puzzles and she really likes talking to people. She's really energetic and like bubbly. She knows how to swim from a long time, and she was able to teach Brie. Well, let's hear from our celebrity reader, a woman who knows a little something about swimming, Olympic medalist Natalie Hines. In this scene, Brie shows up for her first swimming lesson, wearing floaties on both arms and legs and a yellow swim tube around her middle. I'm not taking any chances. Oh, dear, Brie. We won't need some of these today. Come on in, Brie. It's safe, I promise. Stay calm, stay calm, stay calm. It's a magical place. And the same pool I learned to swim in as a girl. Got your swimsuit? Oh, I'm prepared. Okay, get changed and I'll see you poolside. Those were our pool safety rules. We'll go over them next time, too. Our first lesson is simple. Hold your breath underwater for five seconds. Can you do that? I think so. Starting in three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five. <gasps> Good. Now try floating face down. Very good. Easy, right? It's even easier on your back. Let's give that a try. Okay. <coughs> it's okay. It'll be okay. Want to try again? Mm, no. Okay. That's enough for today. Remember, everyone learns step by step, learning a little more each time, adding more pieces. It's a process. You're already better than you were this morning, right? Yes, ma'am. And tomorrow, you'll be better than today. Tomorrow? But I have a sleepover at Clara's tonight. Then don't sleep in. I'm picking you up bright and early. talk a little bit about history, about pools and African Americans. What do we know? It still happens today, but like back a long time ago, things still happen where people, black 
people were being left out and um and people of a different race got to go to a better pool but the black people had to go to like the old and like like really dirty pool they were like kind of like i could say like they were left out too because i when i wa- when i looked inside the book i found out that acid was poured inside a pool and um I forgot this man that um but he got murdered by somebody. I never knew that black people couldn't swim because um today it kind of still happens but not really that much in those days. Yeah, let's talk about that because that's sort of like this urban myth that black people cannot swim. So explain historically why do people say that? The black people weren't able to swim, you know, they only had the dirty or small pools and and you know the other people had you know their own pools and you know weren't really sharing and it wasn't you know fair for them because still there was racism at that time and do you guys know how to swim yes and where'd you learn and how'd you learn I think I my mom told me this but I think where I learned how to swim is my mom um taught me at this place I can mostly kind of like swim at the deep end, but I'm not really sure, but I do know that I can swim, so that's yes. I can kind of swim, but not really. I usually need a pool noodle to be able to swim, but like I can't swim without it, so yeah. Do you want to learn to swim better? Yes, I I I want to take lessons maybe this summer on how to swim. Oh, yes, I do know how to swim, and I got taught by my mother. Well, what about you, Natalie? How would you learn to swim? So my mom taught me how to swim before I went into lessons, so I guess she taught me how to be happy and very comfortable in the water. And then I did lessons when I was about four or five years old and then started competitively swimming at six. So I've been swimming for a really, really long time, but I love the water. I learned to swim in my neighbor's backyard pool and then the rest is history. with negative thoughts that keep coming to her all the time. I mean, how do you guys deal with negative thoughts that creep into your brain? When I have negative thoughts, I just try to think about something else that makes me happy or like something I'm looking forward to. Like sometimes I do overthink a lot, but I just think about things that make me happy and usually they all go away. I have I ha- used to have negative thoughts a whole lot cuz um I would get bullied in school, and I would mostly think that I wasn't meant to be in the school, but some of my friends were, like, kind of just, like, telling me that, like, one of them, they had an important lesson that that you can either just stand up for yourself or you can either just pretend that you didn't hear it and probably just say something nice back to them because the only way to just make them feel like that's wrong is to just push them with, like, kindness and mostly... Why do you think Johnny Christmas, the author, made jigsaw puzzles such an important part of this book? Puzzles have an important lesson in the end because what I saw is that at the end of the story, it had an important lesson with the puzzle because there was a lot of puzzles in the chapter because Bree liked puzzles and Miss Edda liked puzzles and the dad liked puzzles too, but Puzzles have an important lesson in the end, just like a lesson in the end of a movie or a story. Bree's dad isn't really happy when she says she's going to go and do swim team initially. He would rather have do what? Have her do what? Math. Why do you think he feels that way? Maybe he thinks that swim isn't an actual class because he don't do like any problems or any tests for swimming. And I think he thinks that math is more important because it's like he thinks it's like an actual school subject, even though swimming can be too, since it's Bree's class. And I think it was good that Bree tried out something new. Yeah, what do you think that is that parents sometimes really focus on one thing and dismiss other things? I mean, is, have you, have you, has your parent ever said to you, yeah, well, that's nice, but I wish you would do X, Y, Z instead? Oh, well, kind of for me, because um, my parents want me to be good at math and geography in my school, but 
Um, I don't really like those subjects that much because they're hard, but they want me to like know the hard stuff so I can be smarter. But I really like classes like art and music. Like they're really fun for me. I think they they just say that so. They just want you to get better education, I think. They probably don't understand that sometimes um, students might like art, music, theater class better since it, it kind of like relieves your stress since you don't have to do any paperwork as much and you get to kind of release all of like your thoughts and stress when you do those classes. It's not that I don't like math and geography. It's just that sometimes I feel like I need one of those classes in the day to like help me calm down. I remember this one time I got like a one out of ten on my test, and ever since that test, my parents were like shocked. So they wanted me to get like a tutor, multiplication facts, and they wanted me to like learn a whole lot. Who should read this book? I would recommend this this book to anyone who likes to swim or wants to know how to swim like me. I have this classmate who is like on a swim team too. So I, I really want to recommend that book to her because she she goes to like swim competitions every week. She goes there like every day. I would recommend to people that don't know how to swim, they can read it. Lots of other people do do too because I mean it's like a lesson for people that do know how to swim and don't know how to swim because I could tell that at the end of the lesson that even though you don't want to try something new you've like I could see at the bottom of the page it says small waves and big changes. You guys got some questions for our writer Johnny Christmas? I want to know this question if it was like based on a true story because every time I read a book I'm always like is this a story if like a real story or it's a made up story that has a lesson in the end? Swim Team is somewhat based on a true story in that when I was a child about five years old I fell into a swimming pool and I almost drowned and uh, the quick thinking of my Uncle Mac he, he pulled me out of the pool and um, and that was you know great, but that uh, set within me as fear of swimming from that point onward. And I was always and still even to this day a little bit shaky around the water. Like you know I, I could mechanically do it, but I, the, the fear still kind of set in there. So I wanted to write a book for the kid that I was then to know that a book that would be a friend to me as that kid then, you know, to let me know that some of the stuff that was baked into my experience of not knowing how to swim at that age was um, systemic. Some of it was this, that, or the other one, but to give kind of a framework to work off of. Are you going to make a sequel to um, the book? Because I want to know if if they're going to, maybe in the sequel, they're going to add like what happened to the mom and maybe some other things that weren't really like described in the like the first part of the book. As of now, no. I, I, I'm, I'm moving on to, I have like so many stories that are just, like I was saying about like all the popcorn, of, uh, so many stories that I'd like to get to. Um, but I know better than to say never. What mostly happened to the mom? That's a, you know, it's funny how little I get that question, which is really interesting. I wanted to leave space for Miss Etta to get in there. Uh, and if Bree's mom was there, I don't think there would really have been a space for, for Brie to feel that crushing loneliness when her dad's working so much or for Miss Etta to step in and such a, um, fill such a huge place in her life. So it's funny. I don't think I've answered that question to myself. I, I know it's not tragic what happened to her mom, but I, I, it's, it's, it's a really, what's, what's really interesting about the question is that I, I gave myself just as much information as a reader did. Like I know her mom's alive and well, but her mom's not there. So I just left it at that, and, and in my head, I'm kind of assuming it's a divorce, but I, I, didn't, I haven't given myself a definitive answer yet, as odd as that may sound. What was your favorite part about making the book? My favorite part of making this book, well, there's, there's two parts that are, are fun. The, the most fun is always inking, because then you enter a state of what they call flow, where you're, you're doing the mechanical process of, of, the, um, of the drawing, but all the major thinking has been put has already been done on the script side, thumbnails, penciling. 
So now you can just like draw with complete and total freedom. So every discovery you find at that point is just like a pure joy. Like I, I work at a standing desk, so I'm kind of moving around. Maybe I'm listening to music. It feels really good. And it's like a really nice reward after the long months um, or year of, of making a book. And the other first part is um, the concept stage where before the book really has like a, a firm script where it's just ideas and it's just you're just erupting all these possibilities. And it's all like just so much fun until you have to actually take all that stuff and make it a cohesive something or another. But that stage is really fun because it's just, it's just pure possibility uh, and potential. How long did it take to make the book? That's a good question because I, I wrote it in chunks. Ah, how long did it take me to write it? Just the writing part, I would say maybe uh, two, three months, maybe three, two, three, maybe two, three months. Because I, I wrote for like a month and then I then I was doing went off to write other stuff that I had to do. Then I was back for two weeks. And then and then I think there was like maybe a, a dedicated month and a half of just writing at it. Um, so I would say maybe three months, but it could have it could have been slightly more, but just like in little bits and pieces. Illustrations, um, all in all, it was about a year. So illustrations were hmm, maybe like four or five months, something like that. I, um, I had uh, help with some background artists just to like knock out some backgrounds that helped spe- that helped speed up things uh, quite a bit. But I'm pretty fast. So I would say, you know, it would take probably like five, I think it was, with the inking all in, probably like six months maybe. Now we come to the part where I ask the hardest question on planet Earth. <laughs> I know, except it's not that hard. It's just tell me what is your favorite book and why do you love it? My favorite book right now is um, The Babysitter's Club. I also like those books. Why? Because um, it's very interesting about babysitters and how, you know, they make some money of taking care of people and how their life and their name and, you know, things like that. I also like The Babysitter's Club and um, The Diary of the Wimpy Kid, too. It's a good book, and it's interesting. It's funny. My favorite book is called Recommend It For You, and I read it over Thanksgiving break because we had a 200-minute reading challenge. So in the in my library at school, I just found a book, and, it, and the cover looked cool, so I started reading it. And it was really entertaining, and I actually went over the challenge because it was so, like, it was so good. I really liked it a lot. I like it because it's realistic fiction, and realistic fiction books are, like, my favorite books. And I feel like it's, it's like, kind of... Um, it, it feels like it's like something that could happen in real life, and I really like that about the book. My favorite book is this book called Drama. It's from Raina Telminger. Why it's called Drama is because it catches like a lot of drama, a lot of like love stories mostly, and a lot of acting. And then my second favorite book is I've never told like my sister this, but I kind of like like this book called Harry Potter. My friends have been like talking about it, so I was like curious to know. But when I first like just opened the page, I realized it was like a whole new world for me. So I started like reading it at school and I left it at home like most of the times because I like felt like every day when I come from school, you could read on your book and I would always just after I just pack up my things, I would just take out and just read my Harry Potter book. I'm on page 17 now, and it catches a lot of, like, magic and wands and all that stuff. And this in schools and dragons and everything. And I'm, like, mostly liking it because I know someone in my class that loves Harry Potter. And I'm, like, now, like, liking it like Harry Potter a lot like if somebody told me to read another book I would be like done for okay Johnny Christmas what's your favorite book Love in a Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez first of all just in terms of impact when I first read that book I didn't know that you could do that with a book you know that that a book could be so far-ranging and so emotionally um, rich but also so rich in terms of complexity of uh, the story 
in terms of time of temporally it was going like the, the book spanned decades and different emotional states and you know uh, states of villainy you know and, and, and heroism um and, and pure love and joy and um and it had this uh, I, I love the theme of perseverance and it had this it had that theme in a very unexpected way um in a way i hadn't seen done before and um i don't know um it was the first time I encountered a book that worked in a way, um, I don't know how to say this, but it worked in a way my mind works. Like my mind works in that, um, in that storytelling way about all these disparate things are always popping off like popcorn, but it all makes sense. It's almost like in a dream. Got a favorite book, Natalie Hines? My favorite book is The Misadventures of An Awkward Black Girl by Issa Rae. This book was written in about I think in 2015 and I love this book because it's kind of like a biography of her and of real stories from her life and how she was really really awkward and through time and maturity she learned to love those parts of herself to turn those into confidence into the powerhouse of a woman and a businesswoman that she is today and I love that book because it kind of teaches you that you everybody has quirks about them but if you can turn them into confidence then you can get really far. We'll have a list of everybody's favorite book at our website, bookclubforkids.org. You'll also find hundreds of book suggestions from everybody who's ever been on our show. So no excuse if you think you can't find the next book that you will fall in love with. And if you have a favorite book, you can be on the Book Club for Kids podcast, too. Just have your parent or librarian send us an email, and we will send out all the information. All you need is a smartphone and a favorite book. So email us at kitty at bookclubforkids.org. That's K-I-T-T-Y at bookclubforkids.org. It's the perfect summer project. Oh, when you're not in the pool, that is. Thanks this week to producer Chad Francis. Brandon Baker composed our theme with additional music from Charles Nilman. Emma Stein Kellner designed our logo. Thanks this week to our writer, Johnny Christmas, and our celebrity reader, Natalie Hines. And thanks as well to our readers, Lauren, Samara, Imani, and their troop leader, Tanya Wright, from the Girlfriends Book Club Baltimore. We have a free newsletter full of free tips about how to get a kid to pick up a book, especially this summer. You can sign up at our website, bookclubforkids.org. I'm Kitty Feldy. Thanks so much for listening. And just one last word. July 3rd is the release date for the first book in the Fina Mendoza mystery series. It's called Welcome to Washington, Fina Mendoza, and the book is in English and Spanish, and it's designed to get kids excited about civics. It's the story of the 10-year-old daughter of a congressman who solves mysteries inside the U.S. Capitol. Autographed copies are available. 